Hello, uh, my name is Alex Carter, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, what thermal infrared or IR light is um, and how we use the cameras that we use to detect it. So first off, um, I'm going to start with an explanation of the anatomy of light. Um, so the most important thing to know for this conversation is wavelength here, which is the distance between two points in consecutive waves. Now light travels in waves, so this actually determines um, what you see, what color you can see. The next important thing is amplitude. Amplitude is uh, the distance between where the middle line is on your wavelength and either the peak or the trough. Uh, we're also going to talk about frequency, which is how fast these peaks and troughs go past a point in space. And with these numbers, you can uh, get the speed of light. Now, to really understand what we're talking about, you need to understand the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, the human eye can see visible light, or what we call visible light, which is this part of it right here. I'm circling it with my laser pointer. Uh, that's about 0.4 microns to 0.7 microns. Um, which th that scale is much smaller than what the human eye can actually perceive. So we're seeing it as color, not as physical spacings of the beams. When you get into longer wavelengths, you start getting into what's called the infrared. Now thermal cameras see a specific part of the infrared spectrum called the thermal IR, which is from 7 microns to 14 microns, and is this part here. This is what we will be discussing today. So you might be asking, what produces light? Um, what are, what are we actually, what's the physical phenomenon that is uh, causing what we're seeing? So here I have a diagram showing different energy levels. Um, and what happens is energy comes into an atom um, and excites an electron to a higher energy state. Now, eventually, this electron is going to want to decay and drop down to a lower energy state. When it does this, um, one of the things it gives off is light. Now the wavelength of light, which is what we discussed earlier, uh, is dependent on the amount of energy lost during this drop. So here you can see if you're dropping, maybe you get like a much higher drop from here to here, uh, from the sixth level to the first level. Uh, something like this is going to give off ultraviolet light, which is very, very short wavelengths, much shorter than visible. Visible gives off from these levels over here. This is the light that we can see. Now, infrared uh, gives off much lower energy um, and has much longer wavelengths, and is this transition level here. Um, the amount of energy that the wavelength has is dependent on that energy level drop. So now we're getting into a little bit of a more technical discussion. This is, I promise, the only equation that I have in my slides. Um, and here I'm going to talk about um, thermal radiation and how it affects the actual color that you see. Um, so unlike single line emission, thermal radiation is uh, given by heat. Um, so when you see something, you're actually seeing a range of wavelengths. Um, and the color that something that the human eye picks up um, is just the peak of that distribution of light. So here we have um, a range of wavelengths. And each of these black lines is a temperature um, and then the peak over here marked by these red dots, or lambda max, um, and if you remember, lambda is the symbol used for wavelength. Uh, you see that the peak wavelength for each of these different temperature ranges um, gets more and more red. Uh, so eventually the peak wavelength is outside of what the human eye can see uh, and is in the infrared. The equation that we use to do this calculation, um, or one of the equations we use, the most important one, is Planck's law. 
uh, where you have over here your equation. Um, this is your spectral radiance or really how bright it is at what wavelength. Um, and then that's dependent on a few other factors, including the temperature of what you're looking at. Um, the free you can use the frequency of light to get these calculations. Um, and then some other constants um, that are used uh, in physics. So now I'm going to get into the uses of a thermal camera. Originally, thermal cameras were used uh, in the Korean War. They were used to find tanks, uh, people, things you don't want to step on, maybe landmines, because these all give off different temperatures than the area around them. Uh, so here in the tank, you can see that you know, the wheels are, are brighter. That's because they're going to be hotter. Uh, so they're giving off more infrared radiation um, so you can see them better with a camera. Modern day uses include uh, uses by firemen um, in low visibility situations. So on the left, you have an image of what the eye could see. There's a lot of smoke. You can't really see through it. Um, you wouldn't be able to see details. On the right, you have um, the same scene seen through a thermal camera. This camera can see through the smoke because the smoke is not super hot or super cold. Um, and you can see the human lying here on the floor uh, that you might not be able to see with just the human eye. Um, another use, um, night vision versus thermal. So night vision, you are kind of like just upping the contrast. Uh, it depends on how well you can see. Um, there's usually a green overlay. And uh, you can't really see the human. Uh, this is the same scene with a thermal camera. Now, the thermal camera is picking up temperature instead of color. Um, and you can actually see the human behind the bushes. Um, this is because the human is much warmer than the surrounding foliage. Another use um, is thermal distribution in structures. This can apply to buildings, to telephone poles, any man-made structure. You can see how temperature distribution in a structure affects uh, what the thermal camera can see. In this case, heat's rising. Uh, you can see some of the heat here in the window. That's because you can see that that's the temperature of the glass. That's not the temperature, and it's much warmer than the temperature surrounding it. You can also see that the roof, because heat rises, is much hotter um, up here at the peak than lower down. Another use is for understanding geological processes. Uh, in most cases, you don't really want to get up, in personal, up close and personal with a, a volcano. Uh, that said, you can use a thermal camera to observe that same volcano um, to see the geological activity, any thermal activity of the, of the rocks around it. Um, in the top picture, you see that, sure, maybe there's some activity, but you can't really tell what's hot. You can see the smoking. Um, but on the, on the right, you can use the thermal camera to see, oh, you know, it's a lot more active than we thought. That whole side is heating up. Um, this specific image is a comparison of before and after eruption. Um, so you can see that you know, it, it's shrunk down. The, the heat distribution has changed. Uh, maybe the lava flow has changed. Another use, which is uh, more entertaining than the others, is you can actually see human farts. Um, you can pick up on uh, the temperature change of gas, so things that you can't see just in a room. Um, and, and one of those things is when humans pass gas, because a fart uh, is warmer than the area around it. So now we're going to get into biological uses. Um, you can tell that something is warm-blooded versus cold-blooded when you look at it with a camera. Here you can see that uh, this, this particular image is a dog. Um, and you can see that the dog's nose is colder than its eyes or its ears. Um, this is largely because of blood flow. 
um, and what you can physically see is that um, perhaps the dog's behind or the top of its head in this region uh, reads as cooler. This is because the fur that coats it acts as insulation for the dog and keeps that temperature inside. So you're not seeing the heat that it's emitting uh, because it evolved to have fur to keep that heat in. Here we have an image of a snake. Now snakes are cold-blooded. Um, they don't uh, regulate temperature the same way as warm-blooded animals. Uh, so the snake, which is on a human's hand, and humans are warm-blooded, reads as much colder uh, than the human hand. And what will actually happen is if the snake stays on a warm area long enough, um, it will start to warm up because of the way that they work. And you'll actually see a little bit of uh, heat transfer. So perhaps this area here uh, is warmer than this area out here because it's in contact with the warm human hand. Finally, uh, we're going to get into uh, how it can be used to detect blood flow um, and similar things in medicine. So in one of these hands, it's much colder than the other. Uh, you can see this because you know the area around the fingernails is black. This person might have some hypothermia or blood flow problems. Um, either that or they just held a cold water bottle for a very long time. Um, but the other hand you can see is much warmer and you can actually start to see some vein structure in this area here. Um, this is uh, sort of, it's used to understand uh, how well the human is um, perfusing blood throughout their body. So now that I've gone through the various uses for thermal cameras, uh, we're going to uh, go over some of the limitations and actually play with one. So one thing is um, it can actually pick up reflections off of shiny sh surfaces, which I will show you using the whiteboard behind me. Um, and as I've mentioned, it does only detect heat, which means that it reads the surface or that which is right in front of it. Um, if you have a solid surface and something behind it, you can't see that thing that is behind it unless the heat or I guess cold um, is something that can contact the surface um, and change the temperature of what you're actually looking at. Um, another thing is that if you have a lot of water in the atmosphere between you and a surface, that limits how well you can see a surface because the thermal temperature, the temperature coming towards you, um, gets effectively blocked by the water. So now we're going to play with the camera. Um, over here, we have um, a thermal camera. And I'm just going to use this to point at some um, objects of interest. So we're just going to start, Hillary, can I point at you? Oh, right. Here we go. Plug this. Plug this in. All right. Thermal camera's up on the big screen. Um, right now we are pointed at my laptop. Um, so you can see that that has some nice hot spots, uh, especially compared to the table around it. Um, I'm going to point at another person in the room. Yep. So that's what a human would look like. Um, interesting hot spot over there. I wonder what that is. It can be used for investigation too. Um, so just some, some cool tricks. We have over here um, a stack of paper towels. This doesn't look like a whole lot of anything on the screen right now, but what you can do to show that there's heat transferred is if you just put your hand up against it. Now, my hand is much warmer than the paper towels, um, so what I'm doing now is heating up uh, the stack, the roll, um, and because it's paper, you can actually take my hand off. You see my handprint. And I will unroll the paper towels, and you can see that my handprint stays on them even after multiple layers are removed. 
Now this is because my hand was heating up multiple layers um, and causing it to retain heat even deeper down, even once I removed the towel. So I was still measuring that surface, um, but I was able to get multiple surfaces in because the heat conducted through. Um, so now for the reflection, we're going to turn around here, point at the whiteboard. Um, I'm fully pointed at the whiteboard. I'm not pointed at myself, but what you can see is I can move. You can even see the camera in here uh, because the camera is warmer than ambient temperature. And you can see that my reflection moves as well. So that's just one more way that um, thermal cameras can pick up that temperature change. See some other, see my water bottle over there, which is cold, just stuff like that. You can, you can pick up big temperature changes, small temperature changes, depending on how you change your camera. Um, so that's, that's what I have for you today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed and got to learn something about thermal IR cameras.